Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so this talk is called The Block Paved Path to Structured Data. Um, I'm going to find out if this clicker works. It does. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Maggie Appleton. I'm head of design at a company called Hash. We're still a small company, but we work on knowledge man management and decision-making tools. Uh, and I tend to describe myself as a designer-developer hybrid, but I originally studied cultural anthropology, and that comes into my work a lot, which you might see later. So um, that slide's broken. I'm not sure why. Um, but this is supposed to be a URL for the slides for this talk that you could go see um, online. So it's maggieappleton.com, so myname.com, slash block data. Um, and if you go there, you can see all these slides. So if your view's blocked or you just want to reference these later, do that. You don't have to take photos. Let's hope the rest of the words show up. We'll see. <laughs> um, so to give the punchline away early, I want to tell you the thesis I'm here to convince you of by the end of this talk. So I want to convince you that block-based interfaces can help us create more structured data, specifically on the web, right? The place where all our data communication already takes place. And I'll define what I mean by terms like block-based interface or structured data as we go, but I just want to give you an idea of where we're headed. So here's a quick outline of the plan. We're first going to talk about why I care about structured data at all, why is it important. We're then going to look at the rise of block-based interfaces. These are a fairly new interface pattern that have come up in the last five years. I'm then going to talk about some of the problems with our current block-based interfaces. And lastly, I want to introduce a protocol that we've been working on at Hash that tries to address some of these problems, both with structured data and with blocks. So first, why care about a world where we have more structured data in it than we currently do? Like, why is this a worthwhile dream? This might be redundant for some of this audience. If you're at a structured content conference, I assume you care about this. But there could be people watching who have a vague notion of what structured data is or why it matters. So I kind of want to make sure everyone's along for the ride. So structured data means different things to different people uh, and in different contexts. And we just heard a bit of a definition about what structured content is. And for the purposes of this talk, assume structured content and structured data are roughly the same thing. I think we could kind of nitpick the differences, but pretend I'm talking about structured content every time I say data. It's just the term we use in the world I come from. So I'm specifically going to be talking about structured data on the web. So the web, right, is filled with plenty of content. Uh, and for the most part, computers have no idea what uh, most of this content is about. And that's because it's unstructured, which means we haven't labeled it in a way where computers can understand what it's actually about. Mostly, it doesn't have good metadata. So let's say I want to go search for something on the web, right? I'm going to search for this book, Exhalation by Ted Chang. Great read. Uh, and if I search the term exhalation in any search engine, I'm going to get some results that are about the book. Sorry, this is a bit blown out, but hopefully you can see. Uh, I'm going to get some results that are about the book, but I also might get results that are about breathing techniques or, or medical conditions, right? The computer doesn't know the difference between exhalation the book and exhalation the biological concept because these websites aren't built with structured data. But we can fix this by simply adding structured data, which means labeling the content in a way where computers can understand it. So we programmatically declare a type on this content, calling it a book, right? And we declare certain properties and expected data types. So a book is going to have a title, right? That's going to be a text string. It's going to have an ISBN number. That's a number. It's also going to have an author, which is going to be of the type person. So we also have connected types here, because person's going to have you know, a name, an address, a birthday. You kind of get the point. Uh, and so um, essentially, uh, computers are then able to understand what this content is about because we've given it a programmatic way to do so. To give you a more practical example of what I mean, this is unstructured data on the web, right? This is plain HTML. This is a hypothetical website for this conference, and it's got you know, the title in an H1 and the, the, the description in a paragraph tag. Uh, and to the computer, this is just mystery nonsense. It has, it has no idea we're talking about an event. Versus this is what machine-readable data would look like. So this is an example using JSON-LD, which is json linked data, which is essentially the most common format on the web being used right now, that declares that this thing is of the type event, right? And it has certain properties. It has a start date and end date. It has a, a, a location, which is of the type place. So we get those connected types going again. So some people are like, well, this sounds familiar, right? There's this thing called the semantic web that I'm sure lots of you have heard of. Uh, and this is a dream that's been going for 15 years. Uh, and it's this dream that the whole web is going to become interoperable structured data. So every single website will be able to pass data to every other website in a sort of seamless, automated way. Uh, and the promise is this, this is going to lead to really fantastic UX experiences, because every website has this really rich 
contextual understanding of the data that's in it. And this is a really good dream, um, but to put it lightly, it's become quite complicated over the last 15 years. Um, a number of really large problems have, have come up. Uh, and I'll first say up front, I'm not a semantic web expert, and it's a touchy subject, so I'm going to step very lightly. Um, but there are some well-known issues. The first and perhaps biggest is that ontologies, meaning those data structures we saw, are relative, culturally relative, and they're always subjective. Like, it is very difficult for us to all agree on universal structures for the way data should be. So even if you take the concept of a person, right, we would think, okay, people have names, they have birthdays, surely we can agree on some of these. But even that, on um, schema.org, which is kind of this repository of the most well-known schemas that Google uh, maintains, they have person having a first name and a last name. Now, there are tons of cultures where they do not name people with first names and last names. That concept makes absolutely no sense. So you can't put their names into a form that expects a first and last name. And that's just one of many, right? Postal addresses. We have really structured postal addresses in places like the United Kingdom and the, and the US. But there are places where the official address of a house is like, go 200 meters past the temple and turn right. That's the fourth house on the left. Um, and that's never going to change. Like, human culture is inherently pluralistic and we're never going to agree to universal standards. Second is that there will have been a lot of competing formats that have been suggested. So I showed JSON linked data. There's also RDF, OWL, microformats. There's others that haven't been as popular. And there's ended up being a lot of infighting and debate over which format we should use rather than trying to move the movement forward. Third is incentive issues. So at the moment, it takes a lot of developer effort to put semantic data into your website. And there's not a lot of immediate payoff so really, people just don't end up doing it. There's too much friction and not enough profit from it. And lastly, when you're trying to make the entire web structured data, this gets very complex. You're really working at scale. And it just exacerbates all the previous problems. So we've end up, ended up in a place where the debate around the structured web is kind of an unhelpful binary. You have people on one side being like, well, semantic data failed, and it's never going to work. So we shouldn't pursue structured data anymore. And on the other side, you have a group of people saying, the whole web still needs to be semantic, like this dream must become a reality. And they're trying to pursue the dream of all structured data. And what this misses is this sensible middle ground of opportunity, where we could have smaller local structured data within companies, within groups of companies, within academic institutions, among communities, where it can be incredibly valuable and we don't have to pursue some universal dream. So the original idea wasn't really the problem, only the scale of it. Because structured data is very clearly useful. Uh, the most common use case that most people recognize is that they give us really rich search results in SEO. So what this looks like in action is if I've searched for carrot cake on Bing, which is the search engine I know the vast majority of us use, um, <laughs> it knows which sites are about cake, and it can show me really beautiful photos of all that cake. It can show me metadata, it can show me keywords, and I didn't have to click on anything. Right? I, this is a much better user experience than me having to just read a wall of text and click around and find the information I want. Similarly, this is me searching for the book The Dawn of Everything on Google, slightly lesser known search engine, but they're doing really good work on semantic data. Uh, and it knows which sites are selling this book versus which sites are just doing a review of this book or mentioning this book. So it really has a rich contextual understanding of who's talking about this, about this book and in what context. Um, so all of this is possible through structured data. Really, it's like our best modern success story. Second is that structured data can give us really great content management and adaptable UX. So this is what everyone else at this conference is probably going to be talking about the most. It makes it easier to manage content within companies, and structured data allows us to kind of adapt and reuse the content in many contexts. Tools like Sanity are, of course, a great example of doing this. Um, so this is an example of an event content model from Mike and Carrie's book. Um, designing connected content, uh, and it shows a really clear mental model that the user then has to be able to navigate this stuff, right? It allows them to reuse this content in a whole variety of UI implementations, context, devices, and mediums. It overall just makes the user experience much better. And lastly, structured data makes life much better for data scientists and academic researchers. So data scientists need really good quality data to work with, and at the moment they have a lot of trouble getting it off the web. They have to spend a ton of time cleaning and formatting it, and having more structured data out there would make their work much better quality. There's also a lot of interest from the academic community who create what they call knowledge graphs. They're essentially ontologies or schemas, 
where they make them in domain-specific ways that allow them to share knowledge within the field of like microbiology or history. So back to our useful structured data binary. Right now, we're about here, right? There is very little structured data on the web. And there's not much in the way of accessible, high-quality software that helps us create ontologies and structured data. And I kind of want to know, like, how do we get here? Right? Not all the way to all structured data, but how do we just nudge ourselves further to the right? So the goal is more structured data, not all structured data. And one of the major barriers to this is that almost all our existing tools are only designed for developers. So all the effort has gone into develop developing things like RDF, OWL, JSON-LD, uh, and a lot of this kind of debate over syntax formats and effort has gone into convincing developers to get on board with this dream rather than other people who might be interested, like designers and content people. Uh, and this is a really rough user interface to work in, right? Like, this is certainly not accessible. So it brings us to a pressured question. How do we make it easier for everyone to create structured data? And specifically, what types of interfaces enable non-developers to create structured data? So I have a hypothesis, and you can probably guess what it is, blocks. So I'm now gonna talk about the rise of blocks and composable interfaces. So there's been a huge surge in block-based interfaces over the last five years. And first, like, what do I mean by a block, right? Well, you have definitely seen and used a block. This is Notion. So this is one of the apps that has arguably made blocks such a popular interface pattern. You typically have a page, and you type the slash command, and it gives you this little menu, and you can pick from a format, like a bullet point list or a table. And then you can change the state of that block even. If you make it a checkbox, you can kind of check the checkbox. You can then also sw swap the type and keep the data the same, which is a really critical point. And you can also drag and drop them, so they have direct manipulation built in. You can create really powerful, flexible layouts and formats with this very simple interface pattern. Here's another example. This is Coda, which is probably one of the more advanced block editors. And you can see here they have a really elaborate number of block options. And you're able to do things like you can embed rich media, like this is me putting in a tweet from one of my favorite accounts, no context Brits, you'll see why I like it in a minute. Um, you can also do things like query an external API, like Unsplash. And again, I'm doing all of this without writing code, which is a really critical point. So Unsplash lets you search like free Creative Commons images. And this would be really difficult to do if I wasn't a developer and wanted to create a really rich media document. So we, we kind of become jaded about these over the last few years, like we take them for granted. This is like, we're like, oh yeah, like WYSIWYG, direct manipulation, like what else is new? Um, but this is really difficult, like not that long ago. So these have been a huge leap forward in making the web more accessible for more people to publish really powerful stuff. And the interface patterns in these apps have become quite consistent. So this is uh, that slash editor in WordPress Gutenberg, used by, of course, hundreds of thousands of people, Notion, Coda, it's all become quite standardized. Some, the more, some of these apps also put them in sort of a sidebar or pop-out menu. So this is like Retool, Glide, WP Elementor, where they give you a, a whole list you can pick from. Um, so we've seen a couple examples now of, of what blocks are, but I want to give you a more def like concise definition, let's say. So I like to define it as it's a single unit of content within a document or canvas that can be flexibly composed and rearranged that has a type that determines how it displays data. So a table obviously has rows and columns. You could change that type while the data stays the same. So you can take that data from the table and turn it into a Kanban or an image gallery. And then this is the key part. End users, not developers, can input, edit, and delete that data. Right? So the users are in control of the data rather than the, the devs. And it enables what I call modular composable interfaces. So these blocks are flexible. The users can use them like Legos to drag and drop them into place. They have this choice of a wide variety of types. And this is, of course, very easy to use. So these interfaces are clearly very powerful and very popular. And to explain why, I want to reference a quote from Joel Spolsky, who co-founded Hash. So I apologize for quoting the founder <laughs> in a talk about it. Um, but he also founded Stack Overflow and Trello. You might have heard of him. Um, and so he spent a lot of time thinking about this space. And he said, the great horizontal killer applications are actually just fancy data structures. And by horizontal applications, he's talking about apps that have a really wide variety of use cases. So think of spreadsheets or word processes, things people can use from everything to doing financial planning to making a to-do list. The user kind of is in control of what they use it for. And the reason that that works is it just gives them really great data structures to work with. 
And I think block-based apps are kind of a meta medium for creating horizontal apps because they're a material that has this endless potential to make things where you can kind of pick your own fancy data structures from a wide list. So unsurprisingly, these block-based apps have started appearing everywhere. This is a selection of some of the block-based apps that are currently available. This is not comprehensive. This is just a very small slice of them. And there's kind of three main categories they fall into. So first is what I would call document makers, wikis, and knowledge management. This is kind of like note-taking uh, or team wiki stuff. Uh, and this is definitely the most popular use case at the moment. Second that's coming up is WYSIWYG website builders and web publishing. So this is like WordPress Gutenberg, Webflow, Squarespace, things that are explicitly designed to help you make landing pages or contact us pages. And I've put Notion in here because even though they're technically a wiki for teams, everyone uses them to build websites because it's a really great website builder. And the third category that's kind of just starting to form is what I would call do-it-yourself SaaS tooling. So these are block builders that allow users to do a lot more um, programmatic interactivity. So doing more like if then if this then that statements. They're able to kind of put in buttons and have those buttons affect data in other blocks. Uh, and what we're building at Hash is very much in this category. But I'd say Retool is probably the most advanced in this um, group at the moment. The lines between these categories are a little bit fuzzy. You can probably think of it more as a spectrum of paradigms. Because some make you think you're creating a document, right? It's more that linear data flow. Some make you think you're making a website, and some make you think you're creating a whole application. But they're all using the same basic interface pattern to do it. But the real benefit of these block-based applications, I think, is that they shift power from developers to users. Because they change who has the agency to decide what the app actually does. And when users are able to create their own websites and documents and apps, it really allows them to solve their own problems rather than developers and designers imposing our idea of what their problems are and how to solve them. Uh, and they're doing it in a way that was, like, frankly, impossible five years ago. Like, if five years ago I wanted to put a table into my website, I would be writing the HTML and CSS and JS for that myself, and it would definitely not be as good as what Notion currently offers me as a table. And now I can do it in two clicks. So blocks seem great, right? They're wildly popular, hundreds of thousands of people publishing with them. So like, what is the problem here? And how does this relate to structured data? Well, first, blocks are proprietary to individual apps, and they can't move between apps, right? So if I have a block that I really love, and it's really well designed, like let's say this is a uh, block that helps you render latex on a page, and it's really great, but I want to use it in like my other applications that um, I use that are block-based. I simply can't. There's no way to port it over, right? This isn't like a, a flexible component. Tightly related to that is an enormous number of developer hours are spent reinventing the same blocks over and over. So most of these apps have almost the exact same basic blocks, right? Everyone has like embed and image and header and table, um, but they all have to build them themselves every single time. So building a Kanban block, this is Kanban in Coda and in Notion and in ClickUp, they all work the same. They have pretty much the same format, but the developers had to all build them completely separately. So this is bad for developers in that they're just kind of redoing work that isn't necessary. And it's also bad for users because they have to relearn slightly different interface patterns for what is essentially the same thing. The next issue is that users only get access to a very limited range of blocks. So users get between 30 to 70 blocks in most apps and kind of on the lower end of that in most of these. So this is a fairly full list of choices in an app called Clover. And if you compare this to your current React developer, like if I go on to NPM and search React components, I get over 64,000 packages to pick from. Now, obviously, not all of these are going to be essentially the kind of thing that could become a block. Some of them are more utilities. But still, that shows an enormous discrepancy in the choice and power that developers have to construct an app versus what a user has. So lastly, the biggest one is that there's no structured data and there's very poor interoperability between blocks. So a table in WordPress Gutenberg and a table in Notion, despite having the exact same data structure, they can't share their data structure because they're probably built differently on the back end and they're just not designed to be shareable. Which brings me to our last section, the block protocol. So the block protocol is a project by Hash that's hoping to address many of these issues. It is a standardized way for a block built by anyone to communicate with any block-based application. But rather than directly communicating, they instead both talk to the protocol. It's more like a medium that negotiates between the two parties. So a bit like a set of rules that says what you can say and how you can say it. So any app that talks to this protocol can talk to any block that talks to it and vice versa. And it makes it 
possible to embed blocks that follow the protocol into any app that also follows the protocol. The developers of the block and the app don't have to know anything about one another, they can be total strangers, but they can make their software compatible through this protocol. And embedding is really great, but what really matters here is data exchange, right? Our app has a data store that it controls, and our block wants to create new data, right? Like I wanna type something into my table block. And using the protocol, the block can send that data to the app, and then blocks can do all the standard operations that you would expect, right? They can read data, they can write data, they can edit it, they can delete data. Obviously, with the permission of the app, it is very much like only if allowed. Uh, and blocks can also send data to other blocks, which really leads to some dynamic interactivity between these. I like to think of it a bit like O-embeds or iframes with CRUD operations. Okay, so so what? Like, why do we care that this is possible? Well, first, it means anyone can build a block. Any block-based app can use that block, and it won't require any extra dev work, as long as they both have already set the protocol up. But like, really, so what? Like, what in terms of like practical user implications does this mean? Well, users have more, should, in this world, have more block choice and a much wider variety of blocks to pick from. So at the moment, right, they have this limited list of like 30 basic blocks, which are cool, but they're all quite generic. Uh, we would love a world where users could pick from hundreds or thousands of blocks, right? A much wider variety, and frankly, like weirder blocks. Like you could have a recipe block, you could have a whole bunch of elaborate data visualization blocks, and they're able to use the data they already have and present it in all these kind of interesting different ways that fit the data. Uh, I just want to note the UX I've suggested here where you like kind of stick a search bar on top of a drop down and have this browse all this terrible, no one should do this, I just needed to illustrate the point, but don't design it that way. Um, and then second is that uh, the block-based applications will get access to a much wider range of blocks with for little, very little extra dev work. So right in this wonderful imaginary world, this elaborate list of blocks could go into all these various applications. The developers wouldn't need to rebuild the table block for the hundredth time. They could add new blocks without a lot of extra integration work. And essentially, they could just offer their end users a much better experience, right? That's the whole point of the company. And lastly, I think the one that most people here will actually care about is that structured data um, for better UX and interoperability becomes possible with these blocks. So our blocks must declare schemas. They must declare expected data structures. So my to-do list here, I still have to write a dirty limerick, uh, takes in a task, and that task has an expected list of properties, right? So if it's a JSON blog, it would probably look something like this. It's gonna have a title, a string, a due date, a status, right? It's fairly standard stuff. And that means that blocks can then be designed for specific data structures rather than being those generic formats, right? We could have really specialized things like a flight map that takes in a flight object, a movie review that takes in a movie schema, a bookshelf that only takes in books. Um, and it means we kind of get this really interesting new interplay of the two, of data and views. So you can start with structured data and then find a block that's specially designed to display it. Uh, and the power of this, I think, uh, can best be said by Christopher Alexander's quote, design is finding a form to fit a context. So structured data is a kind of context, and blocks give us the flexibility to find the right form for it. There's also another layer to this. We can also go the other way and use blocks to create structured data. So we can start with a block which has this really friendly UI, right, for editing and entering data. Users are very used to this by this point. And once we um, type values into it, it then creates the structured data for us, right? And this is much better than writing code syntax. This is much better than that JSON-LD interface. So this is all a nice idea, but I'm sure some of you are already thinking of all the horrendous ways this could go wrong, or things you might think are fundamental issues with the principle. So there are definitely plenty of challenges and problems, and we're actively working through them in public. We have very um, open, early alpha drafts of this protocol out because we're actively seeking collaboration and feedback. So if you're someone that finds this interesting, wants to critique it, we are very open to conversation and questions. But there are a few major challenges that we already have draft solutions for. Um, so first is security and sandboxing. Obviously, if you are embedding third-party applications or third-party blocks into your app, you want to make sure that block whether it's nefarious, could delete your user's data, or in, interfere with your own app systems, you need to make sure that your app is secure when you're using it. So we have sandboxing to make sure that doesn't happen for blocks that you don't trust. Second is UX consistency and styling. Imagine you know, thousands of developers all building blocks and you try to put them all in one app. It's gonna be this like, Frankenstein <laughs> model. Um, so we're working on developing 
both uh, good documentation for developers to create consistent design interfaces and also allow embedding apps to pass CSS down to the blocks that will allow them to integrate with their environment more. Third is schema divergence. This one's a little bit inevitable, like I talked about in the beginning. There's always going to be a plurality of schemas and concepts in human culture. Uh, and what we're doing here is using something called same as that comes from the OWL language, where you could have 10 different schemas for a person, and you could say this is the same as. So the, all these people are the same. And if a block wants a person to, put, be, to be put into it, all these different schemas could fit in. And there's many more, but we have a whole FAQ page that has very extensive answers on it. Uh, and we're always looking to add more to those. So you can always reach out and we'll um, answer your question on there. So to wrap this up, I want to say that the goal of this whole project of the block protocol and encouraging more structured data is really we want people to create blocks so that blocks can create structured data so that we can get better blocks from the structured data that we already have. And in turn, we hope this leads to better user experiences. We hope this leads to better data science and in the end, a better decision-making tools, which is really our focus at Hash. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Block Protocol project, you can go to blockprotocol.com. Hash.ai is the app that we're using based off that. On Twitter, I'm at Mappletons. Um, and then again, if you want to see the slides for this talk um, afterwards, that's the correct URL that's showing, maggieappleton.com, blocks data. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you.